Hello, everyone. <clears throat> and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. We're going to give folks just a minute here to enter the room, and then we will get started. All right, hello and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Today we are providing one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NZSRDT, and NCTRC CEU credit. To be eligible for those CEU credits, you do need to remain on this webinar for the full hour today. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box. And I will also send that link to you by email this afternoon. Please be sure to check your email spam folder. This CEU survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time this Thursday. If you have any questions about our CEU process, please be sure to email us at webinars at linksenior.com your CEU certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Friday, August 6. Again, please check your spam folder that day. I will now hand it over to Charles De Vilmorn, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles. Thank you, Megan. Welcome everyone. Welcome all of you. Uh, welcome you, Don Amor, uh, CEO of Is Excellent Living. Thank you so much for joining us and being our speaker today. We're very excited about today's presentation. Before I get started, I'd like to uh, just share a couple of thoughts and a couple of uh, background uh, for everyone to uh, understand what is Activity Strong. I think probably the most important part given today's presentation, today's topic, is to share with you that Activity Strong was started last year in the wake of the pandemic. And as you've probably all experienced, and we hope that we experience, that you experience a lot of it, activities and life enrichment and resident engagement has grown to be much more important. And late last year, Link Senior threw our Activity Strong initiative in partnership with NAP, NCAP and Activity Connection. We decided to enter a partnership with Bridge the Gap. And that has allowed us to expand our biweekly webinars and to include a quote unquote executive edition. And the purpose of the, again, the executive edition is still to be very much focused on everything about res engagement, but to allow us to elevate the discussion with people like Donna, who are COO of organizations, because these leaders right now understand what res engagement uh, is about and how important it is for the quality of life of our residents and obviously uh, building better businesses. So what I'd love to do is invite you and I can thank you for coming today for today's webinar, Inspiration, the, impo the Importance of Mission and Culture in Empowering and Motivating Your Team. Before we get started in the presentation, a little bit of background on uh, the organization and what it is that Activity Strong is about. Myself, I'm, as Megan shared, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Linked Senior. Probably the most important piece here on the pages, I believe that old people are cool. And I, actually, this is one of the values of our organization, uh, Link Senior, which is, again, a resident engagement platform for senior living. So we serve um, thousands of team members like you throughout the US and Canada. And essentially, we, we help you do more. We help augment your efforts towards purposeful engagement and building communities. Part of the service augments existing team members. Part of the service allows engagement to be tracked and measured and optimized. And one of the things as a co-founder of the organization that I'm very proud of is allowing you to have more quote unquote human touch with your residents. We have a team of customer success managers that beyond the technology provide you with you know, the best practices and best in class education and helping you enhance resident engagement. A lot of our work is measured, as I mentioned, but we are the only platform to be quote unquote evidence-based and very proud of our work. 
some of these outcomes are shared here. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out afterwards. As I mentioned, all people are cool. So at Link Senior, we have very strong values. And let me share just a little bit before we get into today's presentation. As I mentioned, I do like the fact that old people are cool. This is something that kind of drives Link Senior for a lot of different reasons. We started this campaign six years ago. Um, two of them very important, two reasons very important. One is, you know, everybody is cool, including the older adults. So it's important to mention it. But also, we're not big fans of this idea of segregation based on age. So this is just an invitation to talk about all of us fighting this concept of anti-ageism, right? This idea of allowing our um, industry, our society to be fairer, uh, and obviously including the others that we serve every day. As I mentioned, Activity Strong was started in the wake of the pandemic. It is open to everyone, all of you and beyond. And the purpose of this, again, in partnership with Activity Connection, NAP, NCAP, and Bridge the Gap, is to acknowledge the fantastic work of activity and life enrichment directors. What you do matters. The fact that you show up at work every day and Donna will share stories of this throughout the pandemic, even if it, were, even if it was one day, is extremely important. And so we're here to acknowledge that, to educate and empower you with better tools. So with that, um, very excited to be um, uh, introducing you to a fantastic speaker today, Donna Moore. Um, I thought you know the best way to introduce Donna is to go back to what is resident engagement. And I personally love the defi definition of resident engagement as the process of collaborating with people that live in our communities, our elders, right? So they can live every day with purpose. And I think there's a number of words that are important in the sentence. You know, I mentioned the word community. They're not a client, right? They live in a place that they want to call home. And we are the enabler of that. And Donna, in her stories, will tell you how her organization is very passionate and motivated towards these ideas. And we are here so they can live each day with purpose, right? So with that, Donna, I'd love to, again, welcome you today. As I mentioned, Donna Moore is the COO at Is Exxon Living. Donna, maybe to get started, why don't I ask you a simple question? What do you uh, love the most about the senior living industry today? Well, thank you, Charles, for having me on today. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, your co-sponsor, Bridge the Gap, and with all of these uh, like-minded folks who are activities and engagement professionals. So thank you for that. Um, I guess what I like most about the industry right now, and I've only been in it three years. I, I have an operations background, but what I like most about the industry and how it's evolving is the ability to really get to know our members. And as we think about engagement, at Isaacson Living Communities, engagement is job one. We stop in the hall and talk to our members. We think that sitting on a couch and holding a hand is, is more important than anything else we can do in our communities. And I just love that. Um, I, I come from a corporate background where we're chasing the quarterly dividend. And I just love that senior living is about bringing your whole self to work and really just engaging with your members or your residents. So I think that's what I like most about kind of what I've seen in the last three years and how things are evolving. Thanks so much, Donna. Um, I'll let you just say next for the next slides and start by presenting your organization. And as we discussed, uh, throughout the presentation, we'll come back to some of the key points afterwards and we'll have a conversation. Um, you, the audience, anyone on the Zoom, feel free to drop your questions on the chat or in the Q&A, we'll pick them up and uh, have a conversation with Donna. Donna, take it away. So um, as you see from the slide here, I won't read it to you as the audience, but my background is in operations. I love operations. I love processes. I love fixing things, making sense out of chaos. And as I mentioned, I've been with Isaacson Living for three years. And I, I feel like this will be my last job. 
I feel like until they get rid of me, I'm not going to leave. I, I love this industry. I love the people I work with. I love the people who are drawn to this industry, the nurturing, caring, loving, loving folks in our audience. Um, I wanted to add my six word story because I, I have started to get into the six word story um, movement, but my purpose, I believe, is to lead, but my passion is teaching. And I love teaching through stories and storytelling and through examples. So that's what I'd like to do with this audience today. Next slide, please. So let me tell you a little bit about Isaacson Living. It is a company that was started by Andy Isaacson in Atlanta, Georgia. We currently have two communities, Park Springs, which is in Stone Mountain, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta. It's 16 years old and it's our flagship. And then Peachtree Hills, which is in the heart of Atlanta in an area called Buckhead which has been open about 18 months. My goal as the COO was to transfer a lot of the practices, really all of the practices from one community to the other, and also try and bring aspects of the culture from one community to the other. And our mission in all Isaacson Living communities is to love and serve members while taking care of the business. We have to do both. If we don't take care of the business, we can't take care of members. If we don't love and serve members, we won't have a business. And the, that mission is grounded by being a pioneer, being innovative and creative. It's by working smarter. It's by being a great place to work so we can be a great place to live and doing all four of those goals, those aspirational goals and culture goals, member goals, will lead us to taking care of the business. We don't lead with taking care of the business, we lead with everything else, and that allows us to reach our budget goals. As a life plan community, we have all levels of care from independent living all the way to skilled nursing. We do call our residents members because this is their home. A resident implies um, a connotation of, of old school senior living communities and not to offend anyone on the call, but we really do think of them as our members and we do think of them as engaging with us in their communities. And I'll show you why in just a minute with a quote from our founder. Our staffing ratios and our high levels of care range from six to one to nine to one. We believe that that hands-on care allows us to engage with our members. And we're a little bit unique in that we don't wear uniforms in our high levels of care. We don't adhere to schedules. You eat when you wanna eat, you rise when you wanna rise. We don't have med carts in the hall because you and I don't have med carts in our homes. We have lots of color. We have staff pictures. We have member life stories. Because when you know your members and your members know you, you're, out, you're able to be with them and they become part of your second family. And that's really the Isaacson Living difference. Next slide, please. This is a picture of Park Springs. This is our community in Stone Mountain, Georgia. We have 500, um, I'm sorry, we have 398 homes and over 500 members in all levels of care. We're on 61 acres of beautiful, as I like to call it. And we have the lake in the middle of our campus, but this is just, it's just a phenomenal place. And our mem members love living here. We have a direct access to a golf course off to the right of our campus. It is a gated community. And unless I told you it was 16 years old, when you walk through it, you wouldn't know it. Thank you, Alyssa, for that comment. We appreciate that. Next slide, please. And now I want to show you a video. Hi. 
when I think about what a hero really is, it's not the general. It's not the first lieutenant. It's the people on the front lines, putting it out there every single day. You work 12, 14, 16 hours a day. You are amazing. We didn't lock in and give up our families for 11 weeks for us. The, the motivation behind the lock-in was to keep our members safe, all of our members. We talk about serving our members, but to see it in action, these people volunteered because they wanted to take care of Mr. Jones. They wanted to take care of Miss Jane, the members that they had built relationships with. It's real, it's not just words. We don't just say it, we were, we were gonna live it. So the first story I want to share with you is about that video. Back in March, well, February and March of 2020, we started sitting up straight in our chairs and really paying attention to what was going on on the West Coast, up in Oregon and Washington. And we started planning for what if, what if COVID-19 came to Georgia? What if it came to our campus? What would we do? And there really wasn't a lot of information out at the time, and we didn't know a whole lot about COVID. My, my best guess was it was like the flu. It would sweep across Georgia in two weeks and be done and gone. And I thought, well, you know, one of the things that we do know we can do is we can lock down our campus. Well, lockdown sounded really negative to me, so I changed it to lock in. And lock in meant that we were going to lock the gate. We were going to ask for volunteers to join us in lock in. And all of our members and ourselves, our staff, would be locked into campus for no more than two weeks outside, chance four weeks, and we would weather the storm. And so I asked for volunteers. And I got 60 hands go up immediately. And they said, pick me. And that wasn't because of me. I'm, I'm not a great orator. I'm not, you know, I'm not the most charismatic person you're ever going to meet. I'm, I'm just a girl who's leading a bunch of folks at Park Springs and Peachtree Hills Place. And, and when I said I need volunteers, they raised their hand because of our mission of loving and serving members. And we thought that lock-in was the right thing to do. We had to go about figuring out how are we going to do this and how we're going to make it work for everybody. When I asked for volunteers, I didn't know how to make it right for staff. And so because we put our members first and they serve as our second family, those 60 folks said, pick me. And I said, I'll make it right for you. Thank you for volunteering. And at the end of March, we locked in with 60. And by the time we left, 11 weeks later, we had 75 folks. And 100 had cycled through. But 75 folks were on campus for 75 to 77 days. And that is about our mission of loving and serving members. And that is about folks wanting to do something bigger than themselves and having purpose in their work life. And that is very, very motivating. And it comes from the top. And if you look at this picture on in the PowerPoint, that's our, our CEO and our founder and what I call our chief visionary officer. That's Andy Isaacson. He's my boss. And his mom. Andy had a fantastic career career in commercial development. But when his mom and his dad aged and they needed higher levels of care, 
Andy started studying the senior living industry. And his mom moved five times because they would get the call that said, we can't take care of her anymore. You've got to move her to a higher level of care. And Andy said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to take care of seniors. It's too hard on families the way we do it now in this industry. There's got to be a better way. And Andy said, live here, or the old model says, live here and we'll take care of you. Andy's model and the Isaacson living difference is, live here and take care of yourself. Be in charge of your own decisions. We'll help facilitate a highly rewarding lifestyle for you. And that's an all level of care. And so it really starts at the top for us. I've never known senior living other than under Andy's leadership. So the way we do it is all I know how to do. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, but I'm going to take it as a blessing. Because that type of leadership, no matter where it is in the organization, is inspirational. One of the things that we said during lock-in, because we all live together for 77 days, is once you know me, you can't unknow me. I now have 32 sisters that lived with me in the health center and three brothers. That is, when you go through something like that together, it can't help but make you stronger and tighter as an organization. But it that didn't cause our culture. That was as a result of our culture because that's who we are and how we take care of people. Next slide, please. Here's some pictures from lock-in. On the far left, you see our director of accounting. She's now our executive assistant director of uh, some shared services, that's Ginger. She's in our, our store with a member. And then the middle picture was uh, very poignant for us because we were in lock-in during Mother's Day and we had to find a way to connect families with moms. And you see on the, on the right side of the slide, the lady in the pink, that's one of our care partners of CNA. And the woman in blue is one of our members in memory care up behind the fence and her family's in front. We figured out that if we could get our members that lived in higher levels of care on a porch, that we could facilitate them seeing their families. And this was during the time where you couldn't intermingle and we were still in lock-in. So visitors and families didn't come in and we didn't come out. And this was what we could do on Mother's Day because family is important. You see the, uh, for all of our, our, our uh, attendees that, that have art programs, you see the last picture there, that's in, uh, that's in assisted living. We have a fantastic art instructor and her, her studio is the most popular place on campus for the assisted living crowd because she gets engagement. She gets that engagement it's not, it doesn't have to be an event. It just has to be getting together and doing something purposeful. Next slide, please. The second message I wanna share with you today is Build a culture in your organization that brings out the best in employees every day, even in times of crisis. Well, I've shared with you the lock-in story, which was in a time of crisis. I want to share uh, the story of this golf cart. As you see in the picture, I call this the story of a landlocked golf cart. This golf cart was, at a, uh, was in a parking lot. And in front of it was a curb and then woods. And you see over time, we had started stacking wood back there and that golf cart couldn't get out. It sat back there in that position for over two years. And I had an employee come to me and say, I need a golf cart. Tell me why you need a golf cart. Well, it would make me more efficient and I could get around campus easier and everybody has one, I want one. I said, I'll make a deal with you. There's a golf cart. 
You know which one I'm talking about. It's the landlocked golf cart. If you can get it out, you can have it. And I'll even pay to repair it. That employee had that golf cart out in 45 minutes. Look at how much wood is surrounding it. He had that golf cart out in 45 minutes. We nicknamed the golf cart El Guapo. But he had a purpose. He had a drive and he had a motivation to get that golf cart. And he repaired it himself. Those are, those are great stories to share when you have messages of innovation, of, of tenacity, of you know, can do itness, and we share those stories all the time. I still share the story of the landlocked golf cart. And we believe that while we were heroes in Lockin, everyone has an opportunity to be a hero every day in our communities. The other thing I wanna share with you is that we are intentional about hiring the best. And when I say best, I'm not talking about skills. We screen for skill, but we hire for cultural fit. Do, are you the kind of person that's going to be successful here? Are you nurturing? Are you caring? Do you love serving? You may not have served seniors before, but do you have a nature of service? Do you have a heart of compassion? And so we, we look for your skills. If we need a nurse, you've got to be able to nurse but we look for your heart too. And that's really, really important to us for the cultural fit. We also do something once you come on called spirit training. And this is what we call drinking our Kool-Aid. And this is how we do what we do on our campuses, how we take care of members. Members make their own schedule. We don't have to get folks up at eight o'clock in, in the morning so they don't miss breakfast. If Mr. Jones wants to eat breakfast at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m. he can, or for dinner, he can eat whatever he wants to eat when he wants to eat. There's really no schedule to the day. There's no uniforms. We believe that medicine cabinets belong in our members' rooms, not medicine carts in the hall. And all of that is taught through our spirit training. So my message to you here is be really, really deliberate about the culture you want and find a way to weave it into your organization, not layer it on. Weave it into your orientation, weave it into your training. Be very, very deliberate about your hiring practices and tell stories about the good behaviors you wanna see in your new employees and other employees that you have on your campus. Next slide, please. Here's a few more pictures from Lock-In. I just wanted to show you this because this is about bringing the best out in employees every day. The picture on the left is our healthcare administrator, uh, washing the hair of Miss Priscilla. When we were in lock-in for 11 weeks, the thing that Miss Priscilla missed the most was her weekly hair appointment. And so we truly were working 12, 14, 16 hours a day because we were small but mighty in, in numbers. But our healthcare administrator was going to make sure that we kept Miss Priscilla's life in our memory care unit in our, um, I'm sorry, she was in long-term care. We were going to keep it as normal as possible. And so when we were dead dog tired at the end of the day, or we had just rolled out of bed and we were still tired, she made a point to take Miss Priscilla into the beauty salon, wash and set her hair, sat her under the dryer, teased and combed it out. And they, they made a good time of it. That is the epitome of engagement for us. That is connecting with the member who has a need and making sure that you can fulfill that need. And for us, we all have titles, but when we were in lock-in, I'm sure that they didn't know, there were some members uh, living in the health center that had no idea what my official title was. 
they just knew that I was one of the volunteers that came in and fed members and vacuumed halls and, and did other things. Um, but that is the epitome of what we do at Isaacson Living Communities. You see me in this middle, pa middle picture. There's a wonderful story here. And you see my director of HR behind me. We're both feeding members. Well, this particular member, I was a little intimidated by her. And I wanted to be respectful, but I also wanted to do what I needed to do, which was to help her nourish her body. And she's in memory care and she, she really resisted eating. And I said to her, I said, why don't, why don't we do it together? And you see her hand on my hand feeding her. She so desperately wanted to have some control over the mealtime experience. And I found a way through her guidance. She let me know that being a team and feeding her together was what she wanted. And she said to me, and she didn't talk often, but she said to me, we're a team. And I tell you, I, that just moved my heart. And that's inspirational too. And connecting with her in that way, it wasn't a task. It was an opportunity to engage with her and really understand what her need was in the mealtime. And then I threw in this last picture here on the right. Do not walk through the plastic zipper doors. If you cross through these doors, you will be fired. If you think this doesn't mean you, it does. We became very territorial over our cocoon. We had zipper walls installed in the health center. No one came in, no one went out. We were very protective because we were fighting this common enemy called COVID-19 and we were going to kick its butt. There was nothing that was going to stop us. And that's what I mean by bringing out the best, even in times of crisis. It's finding something that unites you in these, in these times. Next slide, please. And then my last message to you is how a leader's actions speak much louder than words. And, you know, we all learn this through our careers. Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing unique about that message. But let me tell you how we exemplify it. Living the mission and culture, the story of the 60 volunteers raising their hand. It's when employees see me rushing through the halls to get to a meeting and I stop to speak to a member or I stop to speak to an employee. There's nothing more important in that meeting, uh, in that time, in that moment than me stopping to speak and engage. I love to say, you gotta love them to lead them. And this is about knowing your team, knowing your employees, knowing your members, and so you see in the upper left-hand corner, you know that's me because that's my pink hat again. I wore it all the time in lock-in. Um, on Sunday mornings, I would make French toast for the folks, my employees in the health center. And I made a lot of French toast, but it was my love gift. It was my gift of love to them. Um, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed having me do that. I, I also, you see in the bottom picture, you know, we were craving seafood and I ordered in a seafood feast. I used Uber Eats to, to squelch that, that craving for them. Um, you know, knowing your team members on a personal level, knowing who they are and their children's names and, and really loving them, caring about them as a person, not just as an employee, because we believe in bringing your whole self to work not leave your baggage at the door. Sometimes your baggage comes in anyway, even when you try and leave it on the door, but it's saying, you know, are you okay today? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, the story of the book, about halfway through lock-in, I had to bring together everyone in the health center. And there were 34 of us there. 
And I had to say, COVID's not going away. And I need you to stay. But if you have to go, you can go because you gave me what you promised me. And I hate to ask, but I need to ask, can any of you stay? Because it doesn't look like we're getting out of here anytime soon. This was six weeks in, folks. And I said, you know what? You don't have to say it out loud in the meeting. Come see me over the weekend. It was a Friday night. Come see me over the weekend. I'll be right here. I'm the one in the tent in the community hall. And let me know what your decision is. And, and if you can stay, great. And if you have to go, I still love you. And thank you for your service. I said, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay my book down over here on the table. And if you know right now you got to go or you can stay right in my book. Didn't want to put anybody on the spot. But what I found at the end of that meeting is the group disbanded from the meeting and they were kind of mingling. And slowly but surely, everyone went and wrote in my book. And I said to my director of HR, this is a good sign or a bad sign. I'm not sure what, but I know these people. And every one of them had written, I'm staying to the end. I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you, boss. Thank you for being our leader. I'm staying right here with you. And I mean, it, it still gives me chill bumps, but in the moment it made me cry because again, it's not about me. It's about the mission, about they believe that they were doing something bigger than themselves and that is taking care of people. So as a leader, you got to know when to lead from the front, when to lead from the middle, when to lead from the rear. You know, ask them for their opinions. The folks that work in the processes every day know most about how to serve. Be bold about being able to lead from the front. Be strong enough in yourself to lead from the rear and let others lead. They want to show you what they can do, and they want you to be proud of them. Next slide, please. And this is me leading from the front. You see on the left, that's my zippered wall. I actually moved in the day before the rest of my healthcare team moved in. And so that's me uh, in the zippered wall before we zipped it. That's me in the middle picture in my tent. I actually pitched my, my tent in community hall and brought in an air mattress. You see my chest of drawers in my closet over there on the table, but that was my home away from home and my home office for 11 weeks. And then on the top right, you know, leading from the front, I was the first one to get our vaccine when it came to our campus because I wanted to show my employees that I won't ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. And then in the lower right, you see um, my director of HR. She was my, we, she and I were the two that lived in tents in the community hall. And uh, she was actually my very first volunteer uh, to raise the hand. So just very, very proud of this group of folks at, at Park Springs and what they do every day. I mean, truly every one of them is a hero in some capacity because they believe in what they're doing, they believe in their purpose, and they know that we love them. And that they are, they're just fantastic people who happen to work at Park Springs. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Thanks, Donna. <clears throat> this has been uh, an amazing presentation. I. Uh... I had goosebumps as well, just hearing your stories, Donna. So thank you so much for sharing them. I think, uh, well, you probably saw some of the chat as well. Um, I think we would all agree, Donna, that our industry, the senior living industry, uh, need just more leaders like you. And uh, I think you've been very humble by saying, you know, the things about you and so on. But I, I, I would be surprised if, 
not a lot of our audience member would not like to have you as their administrator or COO or leader. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. I'd love to ask you a few questions. There were some in the, uh, in the chat. And just as a reminder to everyone, if you want to ask a question to everyone or make a comment, feel free to select all panelists and attendees so that your question can be seen or ask a question through the Q&A. I'd love to get started, Donna, with the kind of the quote unquote meat of what you mentioned. Um, when you, and I, first of all, I, I do want to share the fact that I love the uh, word of the lock in. It's such a more, <laughs> much more positive word than anything else we've been using. So, you know, kudos for you and your team for just finding a way to take this word and make it positive. Um, what were some of your concern of your team members and also the family members? I'd love to hear how they reacted in the first few days. I'm sure they had a lot of questions. What was the essence? What was the main concern they had? About lock-in? Yes. So, um, you know, on the employee side, the first couple of weeks, we were in shock in lock-in. At the first five, seven, nine days, we were in shock. We had never done anything like that. And we were just kind of learning as we went. How do we, how do, we do what we do with a limited staff? And I think we were all kind of in shock. We, we really weren't used to working 14, 16 hours a day on our feet. Um, so that was a big, a big change. And what we did was we supported each other. If, if somebody was just too tired to keep on, someone would step up and take care of it. Um, I think with our members, it was originally positioned as two to four weeks in independent living and in our higher levels of care. And we all honestly believe that until we no longer believe that. And our members, one of the best things that we did for ourselves, Charles, is we put together a task force of members who had medical backgrounds and they helped guide us through our 11 weeks on campus and continue to guide us and, you know, having them involved, which is part of our philosophy, mm -hmm. is this is your home, this is your campus, you know, help us and guide us relative to medical issues. We have our medical director on that task force as well. But, you know, I, I think the as time went on, it was, when are we getting out of here? When are we going to be done with this? And so right about that six week mark, when I laid the book on the table, I knew that that was a turning point for us just intuitively is now we got to be focused on what does phase two look like when we leave here? Let's start planning phase two so we can all exit and be confident that COVID's not going to overtake us because we don't want to lose what we just accomplished. So it was about oh gosh, this, uh, this, is a, this is a little foreign. And then it migrated to when are we getting out of here and what does that look like? Um, there was a lot of support from families outside our campus too. And, you know, they, they understood what we were doing, but they missed their loved ones. And I get that. I missed mine too. I was only in there for 11 weeks. Some of our members in skilled nursing didn't see their families for over a year because of the rules and regulations that we have to live by. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, I remember the last community I visited before COVID, it was a community just out of Washington, DC. And I'm used to visiting communities because I love spending time there. But it felt so strange to be behind this kind of a zip wall, like you said, there's just behind, not inside. and. And it was very, uh, it was it was a little bit stressful, kind of, it, it was just, it was weird. That's probably the best word I would use, just weird. And mm -hmm. uh, as soon as communities reopened here in Washington, DC, I was I was lucky we, uh, you know, we volunteered with a community, a nonprofit called a CCRC, actually Lifeline Community like you, called Forest Hills in DC. And uh, when they reopened, they allowed us to be vaccinated as volunteer. And, and then I visited them with my daughters. And it was just kind of a, it was a fantastic moment to be quote unquote back in. So that was very cool. Um, you know, one of the things that I also really enjoyed hearing you talk about, Donna, because 
We know it's a best practice about culture change that's been promoted by the Pioneer Network, this idea that you know, job number one is engagement, like it's this idea of interdisciplinary work. You, you kind of alluded to the fact that when you start, you can't stop, right? Sometimes there's this phrase that says, what has been seen cannot be unseen. That's right. What's, yeah, what's the future for you? Like once you started, like obviously you can't stop, but you sometimes may, you, you, know, you, you want to go further, right? So what's, what's the end of the year? What's next year? What's your next big challenge when it comes to culture change like that? You know, you don't know what you don't know. We we are constantly learning. We are constantly pioneering. Um, one of the things that we've started to do this year, Charles, is we've started doing more uh, focused family education because we are so different, because we are, um, you know, even with our employees, it's like, you don't wear scrubs in your higher levels of care. And it's like, no, no, we don't because it's their home and we don't wear scrubs in our home. So it's, it's really focused in on making sure that not only our employees understand our model of care, but the families, because sometimes what'll happen is an adult daughter will call and say, well, dad slept until 1030, he missed breakfast. So it's, it's helping them understand, no, he didn't. He can have breakfast whenever he wants to have breakfast. He can skip breakfast. He can sleep as long as he wants. So our push in 2021 and in the future will be more on family education about why we're different, not just that we are, but why we're different and what we're trying to accomplish. So we're always looking for ways to pioneer. And that family education is one example of that. You know, the fact that you call residents members is, is fantastic. Are you going to continue calling your families families? Or have you thought about another name or another concept for approaching that essential piece of your communities? You know, it, it, it's uh, we are constantly talking about what we do and why we do it. And mm -hmm. things evolve over time. So who knows? It, it's... Um, you know, sometimes we call them our grandparents. Sometimes we we tell families that they are a part of our community and our households and that mm -hmm. they are welcome to come and go as they please. I mean, term, terms and titles change often. So you never know what's going to come out next. Yeah, that's, you know, that concept. I've been in, in, in this industry just a little bit more than you, Donna. Um, but I think that one thing that you bring that I keep on hearing is this innovation, right? Like questioning in a very positive way, right? Like questioning to improve and so on and to drive the best of people, the best of our, of our organization. And I think that a lot of it, you actually might be bringing from other industries, right? Because, you know, a lot of us, well, I think, I think we, we would all agree that senior living a is slightly slow to adopt certain things, for example. And I'd love to hear from you that has so much experience from other industries. What are the things that you see yourself bringing all the time or that you'd like to share more from other industries to this particular industry? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, we've done a lot. Uh, I love process. And Several of my leadership team, my executive director out at Park Springs went through Six Sigma Greenbelt and he loved it. And, you know, just sharing those, those philosophies about how we do what we do and how do you eliminate waste in your processes. And, you know, your, your processes are really how you deliver service. So that is something that I think I have brought to the table. Um, you know, just constantly challenging the status quo, being open to different ideas about how people do what they do. Um, I've been in several industry and I just think that that philosophy of, you know, can we do it better? I, I think that has just come with me. Um, you know what I what I really want to be involved in, Charles, and I think we are we are well on our way as Isaacs and living as a as a uh, as a community, um, as a company. Is 
I'm, I'm starting to see the sea change in senior living in the United States because of what happened on the West Coast and because of what happened in nursing homes with COVID. And I, we are starting to see that there are better ways to take care of seniors. I want to ride that wave with those other pioneers like, like Penny at Pioneer Network and Josh um, at Bridge the Gap. Um, and Lucas at Bridge the Gap, and those other folks that are that are riding that wave of, you know, Jill, who you've had on your show before, that that mm -hmm. get that there's a different and better way. I want to ride that wave with them. I want to learn from them. I want to be part of, of of implementing change in senior living. I mean, Andy Isaacson, um, he is our chief visionary officer, and he sees the wave, and he has created that in our communities. I just want to be a part of that. It's interesting because you manage again to be so humble, Donna, because you're you're part of these leaders in the sense that, I mean, you've shown action and words of what a true leader is. You've done fantastic work. And, and uh, I, I just want to applaud you here. You know, if you, I, I'd love if you don't mind if we just took a second and paused and also kind of uh, not emphasize, but a lot of our audience, mem audience members sorry, are activity and life enrichment directors. And we know that, unfortunately, historically, activity directors are, you know, one, probably the most valued team members or the people that had the most importance in organizations. Now, through COVID, we obviously, you know, have been shown, again, what has been seen cannot be unseen, like the importance of activities, sometimes it's kind of flipping that. What would be your word of recommendation to like the typical activity or life enrichment director on the Zoom today in helping their organization start that change and be part of that change? What would be your word of advice? So we are very deliberate in our Isaacson Living communities about recognizing the difference between activities slash events and engagement. And I know your audience today, our audience today, Charles, I know they, they get this. And we've got to educate the senior leaders about this difference. And, you know, activities and events are things that you plan. They're, they're, they tend to be big, but engagement is where it's at. You know, just like we have or at least in my family, when I raised my family, dinner time was at the table and we all got together and dinner time was sacred. Same thing in an Isaacson living community, dinner time is sacred and our care partners eat with our members. For our audience today, I would suggest to them that engagement doesn't have to cost lots of money. It doesn't have to be planned. It is spontaneous. And it is as simple as sitting on a couch and holding Mrs. Stewart's hand or taking a walk with a member or having a nail painting event that just springs up spontaneously. Those things are what bring people joy. Not that activities and events don't, but those are things that bring people joy in the, in the, in the quiet moments, in the everyday moments. And if activity directors could help their staff understand that those small moments make the most difference to connect with that member, I think there would be, I mean, they could show just how, how, um, how social their members are, how, how nurtured and caring and loved for their members feel. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. I, I was I'm cycling through everything you just said. There's just so many questions I have for you, but we, we're kind of running out of time. You know, the, the, the one thing you said here, which I think is, is most important is what you said about inviting or educating or helping other team members. I think that we all agree, every team member on the floor wants to engage, wants to do the best for our elders, for our members. You know, I personally like the idea of moving from activities to this concept of CEO as chief engagement officer, right? Activities should be allowing our other care partners or other you know, team members to understand 
what they can bring. So I, I really, you know, I think I think you're bang on. And it is it, like you said before, the cost of this is is zero, right? It's just a mind shift, an attitude. And I think that if we have more leaders like you leading by examples, then everything becomes uh, uh, much easier. Well, and you know, Charles, in that model that you just defined, we we all should be CEOs. We all can be CEOs. Yeah. Yeah, Chief absolutely. Engagement Officers. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Donna, for all your, uh, well, first of all, sharing your amazing story. I'm going to share here on the slide, on the last slide, Donna's contacts and my contacts, if you have any question. Donna, before we go, I have one last question. Well, first of all, I hope, obviously, that you're keeping this book. It's just kind of a, an, a, an amazing summary of everything that you and your community and your team members have gone through. Where's the pink hat? You know, it's at home. I still wear okay. it. It, yeah. it means a lot to me. It means I'm sure. a lot to me. I'm sure. I'm sure. I should have brought it. You're right, Charles. I should have brought it <laughs> and put it on for you at the end. <laughs> Donna, thank you so much. As I mentioned, uh, and as, you know, kind of echoing first what the audience was saying, our industry, the senior living industry, really needs more people like you. So I want to personally thank you for being the on the other side of that zip wall, you know, for showing up at work and having your team lead your team in such amazing, um, you know, and troubling times and kind of really kind of raising out, out of, you know, out of this, and I mean, so on top of this industry and, and trust me, I mean, you are there leading and everybody in the audience agrees through their, their chat and their comments. I think also Donna, one last thought here is that leaders like you, uh, you know, you, you keep on saying that you're trying to innovate, you try to question. I personally like the idea that you can create your own future, right? And I think that it is with leaders like you and with organizations like yours that we collectively can create the future and a better future. Uh, I love this idea of not getting back to normal. I love this idea of, you know, getting to a better normal. And it's only with leadership like yours that this can be done. So again, thank you so much. Everyone in the audience, please feel free to reach out to Donna. Thank her on the chat as many of you have already done. Donna, one last final word before I get into my announcements. Love them to lead them. If you love them, you can lead them and they can lead you. And uh, you know, I just, I think that's the single most, most important thing I do as the COO is taking care of my employees. Yeah. And thank you too, Charles, for your leadership. <laughs> thank you so much, Donna. Thank you so much, Donna. And thank you, Christina. I know you're offline by listening and helping us with this presentation today. Again, everyone, welcome. And uh, thank you for coming to our Activity Strong webinar today. I just want to share a couple of our upcoming webinars. Uh, on Tuesday, August 17th, we will have members of the organization called Christian Horizon. Uh, Kathy Kruer uh, as a, um, is on the corporate team and supports everything related to clinical services and activities and she'll be joined by two of our activity directors in different communities, Shannon and Crystal. And they will be talking about something that we're very passionate about in activities, which is um, strategies about correlating engagement with clinical outcomes. So that's an exciting one. And then I'm very excited about the one on Tuesday, September 7th. Mallory actually started as an activity director uh, in different communities and then started working with an organization called Frontier Management. She applied as an activity director job for a community, um, but the community needed an executive director job. And she got convinced to take the job, go through the training, and then she since got promoted throughout this organization. And she'll be talking about something that I'm personally very passionate about, which is this idea of risk. Right. We know we're very compliant because we are a healthcare uh, industry. And sometimes we limit ourselves kind of just by behavior. So Mattery through the use of Montessori technique and other technique is gonna help us explore how do we take risks, obviously that are the good risks, a little bit what Donna was talking today about, which is innovating to see where are our limits and how we can further the life of our residents. So with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Donna, one last big thank you for your leadership, your stories, 
And I can't wait uh, what you and your organization are going to continue doing. Thanks again.